Okay, let's begin this sermon with a word of prayer. And dear Lord, I want to thank you that you have visited our little meeting this morning. And we pray as we go through this service that you will please be with our hearts and minds, that we will hear the message that you have prepared for us, and that you'll please be with me as I preach it, that I may say the things that the Holy Spirit inspires me to say that the message may get through and that we will leave this place knowing that you have been in our presence we ask in Jesus name Amen Okay Just give me a moment Alright Now the subtitle for this morning's sermon is Advocating for the King James Version when I started this sermon, there was a plan in my head in regards to how the sermon was going to turn out. I was going to go into some depth on the introduction, on the compilation of the King James Bible. As I got into the sermon, it became clear to me that this is going to have to wait until the following sermon. And if you have a listen today, you'll figure out why. In short, this sermon is going to be a prequel to a study of the history of the King James Bible. Since 1880, there has been a strange attack on the primary sources of Adventist authority. Now, I better qualify, uh, since 1880, I should say since around about 1880. I'm not, I'm being too precise there. The primary sources of authority for Adventists have been the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. It has occurred to me that we could almost think of them as the two witnesses that are spoken of in Revelation, uh, which we still understand to be the Old and New Testaments. My only justification for thinking this way is that the attacks we've seen on the King James Bible and the spirit of prophecy have had the effect in the minds of many Adventists of killing off both of those off as sources of authority. One of the things that we observe is that those who accept the King James Bible as their primary source of biblical authority are openly mocked in some circles of suffering from King James onlyism, as opposed to what? Scholarship onlyism? Secondly, Adventists who accept the spirit of prophecy and share it even with the confines of the Adventist church are shamed for doing so on the grounds that it makes us look like a cult. It matters not that there are those outside the church who have read her writings independently and consider her a true prophet of God. So in essence, our two pillars of authority are being destroyed and what does the Bible have to say about this but in Psalms 11 verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, there is one other thing that connects these two sources of authority both the King James and the Spirit of Prophecy were put together outside the domain of the primary religious power of this world that primary religious power knows this and therefore has to destroy both in the eyes of the world regrettably for us they will succeed regrettably for them that will be the close of probation for them because we know that, a time, at that, that at the time of the close of probation there will be two camps in the world and both will be solid in their thinking and nothing but death will change anything in terms of their mindset. One side will be prepared to die rather than change their minds while the other side will be prepared to kill rather than change their minds. How do I know that they are going to succeed? 
Well, let's take a look at Amos chapter 8, verses 11 to 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine, sorry, yes, a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. I've just had a question in my mind as I read that. Why did he say from why didn't he say from north to south? Instead he says from north to east. A question for study in the future possibly. Now this is what God has to say about those who rebel against him. Then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. And then when we go to another verse, 2 Corinthians, and this is an interesting verse, when I read this, I thought, have I seen this before? It goes like this, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believeth not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, I'm going to go briefly off into the weeds a little and make an observation here. We have the mainstream church and we have the independents. We already know that the Adventist church consists of two main camps of believers. One side is touchy feely progressive, social justice warrior type of person who believes that all are equal. The other is the more conservative side that accepts a hierarchical society. Now, for a short while, I struggled, struggled with the idea of labelling myself a conservative in my beliefs, given what the conservatives of the mainstream Adventist church seem to believe. The matter was resolved in my mind when I listened to presentations on the apostasy of our church, and I realised that those calling themselves conservative within the mainstream church, while holding many aspects in common with myself, are in general, at best, apostate conservatives. It's a bit like at the grocery store where you want to get vanilla essence and you get to choose between vanilla essence and imitation vanilla essence. They both look and smell pretty much the same, but one of them is fake. So let's come back to our two sources of authority. This is why I make a connection in the Adventist context between the Bible, Spirit of Prophecy and the two witnesses of Revelation. We have observed obviously strenuous efforts being made to destroy the legitimacy of both. Time will tell if these can be fully considered the two witnesses. There is one thing I will say when it comes to assuming the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy are the ultimate sources of authority. And this is what you should always bear in mind, that if any new information comes to you regarding spiritual things, then ask yourself these two questions. The first question is, what does this new information do to my confidence in the Bible? And number two, what does this information do to my confidence in the spirit of prophecy? If the answer is that it lowers your confidence to either as a source of authority, then that information must be rejected no matter how compelling it may seem, be seen. Oh, seem, sorry. It must be rejected regardless of what such an action might even do to your own reputation. Bear this in mind. I wonder if I've got it here. Okay, so I've got that. Sorry, I didn't miss that one. Okay. All right, so I've got this little quote here. As the controversy 
extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command they will endeavour to suppress the discussions of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power and in this work Papists and Protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment and some will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. But their steadfast answer is, show us from the word of God our error. I never thought in my wildest imaginations that some of the clergy she refers to would come from within our own Adventist church. So today it is my intention to focus on the first pillar of authority that even Ellen White herself commended to us to study as the last act of her public ministry shortly before passing away that first pillar being the King James Bible, how it came to be, who was involved, and what we know about them. <clears throat> I want you to think for a moment. I want you to think of an individual you've had contact with in your life that you know despises you, holds you in contempt, hates you, are your enemy. The kind of person who, if they were to hear of your demise, come to the cemetery to dance on your grave. Now imagine if you can that you've gotten to the trouble with the law for some reason and now you're in court. You're sitting at the defence bar and the prosecution calls in the next witness and you hear the name of the very person that is your enemy. Your heart sinks. I'm done for. You look up and as they sit in the witness box, you lock eyes and you see that hostility written all over their face. You then listen as they begin to answer the questions put to them and your jaw drops. No, your ears have not tricked you, but the things that they have said you know will get you completely exonerated and found innocent. It is often said that the best help that you can get in a court case is that of a hostile witness who tells the truth in your favour. They have every motive to have you stitch up and into a world of hurt, but they have been compelled to tell the truth. For this reason, hostile witnesses, while the most scary to deal with, are also granted the greatest credibility because the truth they tell is not in any way motivated by a desire to see you walk free. Now in court, one thing defence loves more than anything else is a hostile witness. A hostile witness who despises the person they're witnessing on and yet their testimony will help that person. The reason is that this person would love nothing better than to see something bad happening to the person witnessing on, but they are compelled to tell the truth that will end up helping the defence. And speaking of hostile witnesses, I now bring to you the first hostile witness. His name is Christopher Hitchens. Some of you may have heard of him. He was considered by many an atheist, but he described himself more as an anti-theist, in other words, a God-hater. He acknowledged God's existence, or if he said, but essentially said, if God exists, I don't like him. He seemed especially hostile towards Christianity. He regarded God as a moral monster based on the stories of things that happened in the Old Testament. So his conclusion was that if God existed, he would despise him. He's a bit like a friend of mine who's a heathen of some description. He despises the God of the Bible for similar reasons. Christopher Hitchens would be considered a hostile witness, and you'll see why that is in a moment. But while he was alive, he published a piece called When the King Saved God, which in summary was a piece 
praising the King James Bible. Now I'm going to share with you some reasonably extensive quotes from an article he wrote. Okay, just got to keep track of my slides and making sure they're keeping synchronized. Okay, here we go. 400 years ago, an extraordinary committee of clergymen and scholars completed the task of rendering the Old and New Testaments into English and claimed that the result was the authorised or King James Version. This was a fairly conservative attempt to stabilise the Crown and Kingdom, heal the breach between competing English and Scottish Christian sects and bind the majesty of the King to his devout people. The powers that be, it had St. Paul saying in his epistle to the Romans, are ordained of God. This and sorry, this was a sorry, this and other phrasings, not all of them so authoritarian and conformist, continue to echo in our language. When I was a child, I spake as a child. Eat, drink, and be merry. From strength to strength, grind the faces of the poor, salt of the earth, our Father which art in heaven. It is near impossible to imagine our idiom and vernacular, let alone our liturgy, without them. Not many committees in history have come up with such crystalline prose. He then goes on to make the following observation. Bishop Andrews and his colleagues were charged with revisiting the original Hebrew and Greek editions of the Old Testaments, along with the fragments of Aramaic that had found their way into the text. Understanding that their task was a patriotic and nation-building one, and impressed by the nascent idea of English manifest destiny, whereby the English people had replaced the Hebrews as God's chosen, Whenever they could translate any ancient word for people or tribe as nation, they elected to do so. The translator's legacy remains, and it is paradoxically a revolutionary one, as well as a giant step in the maturing of English literature. Until the early middle years of the 16th century, when King Henry VIII began to quarrel with Rome about the dialectics of divorce and decapitation, a short, swift route to torture and death was the attempt to print the Bible in English. In English churches, state-selected priests would merely encant the liturgy. <laughs> Upon hearing the words hoc and corpus, for in the For This Is My Body passage, newly literate and impatient artisans, these are tradespeople by the way, in the pews would mockingly whisper hocus pocus finding a tough slang term for the religious obfuscation at which they were beginning to chafe other language oh, sorry i'll say it again other translations into other languages by martin luther himself among others slowly entered circulation one of them, the so-called Geneva Bible, was a more Calvinist and Puritan English version than the book that King James commissioned, and was the edition which the Pilgrim Fathers, fleeing the cultural and religious war altogether, took with them to Plymouth Rock. After many false starts and unsatisfactory printings back in England, the Anglican Conclave in 1611 adopted William Tyndale's beautiful rendering almost wholesale and out of their zeal for compromise and stability, ironically made a posthumous hero out of one of the greatest literary distance, dissidents and subversives who ever lived. Though I'm sometimes reluctant to admit it, there really is something timeless in the Tyndale slash King James synthesis. For generations, it provided a common stock of references and allusions rivaled only by Shakespeare in this respect. It resounded in the minds and memories of literate people as well as those who acquired it by listening. From the <coughs> stricken beach of Dunkirk in 1940, 
faced with a devil's choice between annihilation and surrender, a British officer sent a cable back home. It contained the three words, but if not, dot, dot, dot. All those who received it were at once aware of what it signified. In the book of Daniel, the Babylonian tyrant Nebuchadnezzar tells the three Jewish heretics Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that if they refused to bow to his sacred idol, they would be flung into a burning fiery furnace. They made him an answer, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. He then immediately goes on to make the following observation. A culture that does not possess this common store of image and allegory will be a perilously thin one. To seek restlessly to update it or make it relevant is to miss the point, like yearning for a hip-hop Shakespeare. Man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward, says the book of Job. Want to try and prove that for Twitter? And so bleak and spare and fatalistic, almost non-religious are the closing verses of Ecclesiastes that they were read at the Church of England funeral service the unbeliever George Orwell had requested in his will. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail because man goeth to his long home, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall dust return to the earth as it was. Now I believe that Christopher Hitchens must have seen but could not say it out loud that while politics may be downstream from culture, that culture is downstream from religion. You can see the effects of that in today's society where the state has become God for the haters of God. He then begins to turn his ire upon those who would try and improve the KJV. I now pluck my, down from my shelf the American Bible Society's contemporary English version which I picked up at an Evangelical Promise Keepers rally on the moor in Washington in 1997. Claiming to be faithful to the spirit of the King James translation that it keeps its promise in this way. Finally my friends, keep your minds on whatever's pure, true and right, holy, friendly and proper. Don't ever stop thinking about what is truly worthwhile and worthy of praise. Pancake flat. Suited perhaps to a basement meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. These words could not hope to pour, penetrate the torpid, resistant fog in the mind of a 16-year-old boy as their original had done for me. There is perhaps a slightly ingratiating obeisance to gender neutrality in the substitution of of my friends for brethren, but to suggest that St. Paul of all people was gender neutral is to rewrite history as well as to rinse out the prose. When the Church of England effectively dropped King James in the 1960s and issued what would become the New English Bible, T.S. Eliot commented that the result was astonishing in its combination of the vulgar, the trivial and the pedantic. All right, now I'll just uh, finish off this last couple of paragraphs and then we'll see if we can look at a conclusion. William Miller excited gigantic crowds with the news that the second coming of Jesus would concur in 1843 and associate followed up with an 1844 due date. These disappointed prophecies were worked out from marginal notes in Miller's copy of the King James edition which he quarried for apocalyptic evidence. There had always been those from the earliest days when it was being decided which parts of the Bible were divinely inspired and which were not. 
who had striven to leave out the book of Revelation. Martin Luther himself declined to believe that it was the work of the Holy Spirit. But their Christianity is well and truly stuck with it. Not to overprize consensus, it does possess certain advantages over randomness and chaos. Since the appearance of the so-called Good News Bible, there have been no fewer than 48 English translations published in the United States and the rate shows no sign of slackening. Indeed, the trend today is towards what the trade calls niche Bibles. These include the Couples Bible, One Year New Testament for Busy Mums, Extreme Teen Study Bible, Policeman's Bible, and somehow, unavoidably, the Celebrate Recovery Bible. Give them credit for one thing. The biblical sales force knows how to be fruitful and multiply. In this cut-price spiritual cafeteria, interest groups and even individuals can have their own customised version of God's Word. But there will no longer be a culture of the kind which instantly recognised what Lincoln meant when he spoke of a house divided. A gradual eclipse of a single structure has led not to a new clarity, but to a new Babel. And I would call that conclusion a hard-hitting um, hard hitting from Christopher Hitchens himself. In other words, the, it would seem that the multiplicity of Bible versions that we see today has brought about confusion in the mind of Christopher Hitchens. I can see where he's going with this and to some degree find agreement with his claim. I've personally observed individuals cherry-pick whatever Bible version that seems to best suit them to support whatever ideology they're pushing. Now it could be said that the same was the situation when King James brought together 54 scholars to produce what became the authorised version of 1611. So the first question we need to consider is how did God protect the Bible so that we could have some confidence that the Bible is not corrupted when the scholars appointed by King James set to work to produce this new Bible version? The short answer is that he made sure there are a multiplicity of Bible copies, fragments and the like. Let's take a look at what Josh McDowell was able to show us. And I'm going to present to you a table. Now you can take a look at all of these, um, all of these numbers, but we've got uh, the language Armenian, Coptic, Gothic, Ethiopian. Total language, uh, Latin translations, Old Latin, Vulgate, Syriac, Georgian, Slavic. Total non-Greek manuscripts being uh, 18,000. And then you add to that 5,800 Greek manuscripts, which give us a total of 23,000 copies and parts of copies of the, the, um, the Bible. And then they go to the New Testament Greek manuscripts, New Testament early translations, which you can see just down over here, plus Old Testament's copies, which is your scrolls and codices, and total biblical manuscripts is 66,286. Now, if you are wanting to corrupt a Bible... How would you do it with that kind of numbers? Now, uh, the question we can ask ourselves is how high do you think this stack of New Testament manuscripts would be? Think about it this way. Of just 5,800 Greek New Testament manuscripts, we have more than 2.6 million pages combining the Old and New Testament, we have the 66,000, which I just referred to. A stack of extant. Now, I had to look up this word, extant, and it really means something extremely ancient, extremely old. A stack of ext extant manuscripts for the average classical writer would measure about four feet high. So we're talking about the Iliad of Nomad and maybe writers such as, oh, what was his name? couple of philosophers, Greek philosophers of the day, Socrates and 
some of those guys. So if you combine all the classical writers of the time, Josephus included, you would end up with a stack of documents about four foot high. Okay, let's go and take a look and try and get a visualisation. If you take a look here on the left side, you've got your stack, four foot stack of the average classical writer of ancient times. You then have the 1792 piece of One World Trade Centre. Then you've got the New Testament, and they're saying that you've got one point, sorry, one mile high in terms of New Testament documents, 1.5 miles high of the Old Testament, and if you stack both of those those uh, two together, you then end up with 2.5 miles of complete Bible. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to have a quick look at a couple of other numbers. We've got the number of extant Old Testament scrolls, and then they go through the various locations where these are found. So you've got the Dead Sea Scrolls, 300, Green Collection, 5,000, Synagogues, 20,000, Museums, 1,000, Private Family Collections, 5,000, Codices, 3,000, Jewish Seminaries, 5,000, and Individuals, 3,000, being a total of 42,000, which is what we saw before. Collectively, all these copies of the Bible end up being referred to as the majority text or the received text. Now, uh, we're going to take a quick look at the selected major classical works. Homer's Iliad, Her Herodot Her Herodotus, History, Sophocles' Plays, Plato's Tetratologies, uh, Caesar's Gallic Wars, Livy's History of Rome. Now, the thing that's interesting, if you look at these, they've got um, the, mo the most ancient um, manuscripts and a lot of them there's a, two or three of them that are showing up before before Christ and uh, most of them are showing up after Christ many hundreds or even thousands of years later uh, he doesn't refer to Josephus which is rather interesting um, but they ended up with a total of 4062 copies of the classical works Okay, uh, now one of the things I want to ma mention before I go on to this particular this uh, particular graphic here, so some of the manuscripts of the Bible have been preserved in some of the most hostile jurisdictions to Christianity. In 2014, an amazing total of 103 Jewish Torah scrolls were discovered in the manuscript section of the Lenin State Regional Library of the Western Russian city of Nizhny Novgorod. Now consider the implications of that. That is in Russia. Russia for 70 odd years or more was hostilely anti-theistic and they endeavoured to remove all traces of God out of the system. <laughs> And yet they were able to find these ancient Jew Jewish skulls in 2014 in this library that had managed to be protected by God all the way through. Now, there is a Jewish group has said negotiations underway with Russian officials to restore the scrolls and possibly display them in international exhibits. And then we have Church Fathers. Take a look at this. Church Fathers here are quoting scripture. And so they're giving the number of times each of these very famous church fathers have quoted scripture. 330 for Justin Martyr. Eusebius, five, over 5,000 times. And if you take it all together, over 36,000 times were these scriptures quoted outside the Bible itself. As I was considering this, I, I began to wonder if the person who invented the cryptocurrencies that we see on the internet now had considered this in mind as a way of tackling the transferal of transactions of value across the internet without having to go through a bank. <coughs> God protected his word from corruption by having a multiplicity of copies of his word placed within the hands of many custodians it became impossible for anyone with an incentive to corrupt, for example, Satan himself, to succeed in doing so. 
It is interesting to note as that as voices have become more strident about historical corruption, that the number of historical copies of the Old and New Testament have become more numerous, making it increasingly difficult to maintain the narrative of historical corruption. Now, as an aside here, this is where the writings of Ellen White are currently in danger. Right now, there's only one authorised custodian of her writings, that being the White Estate of the General Conference, and its sister organisation, such as the one in Avondale. However, there are now a number of people whom God has alerted to this danger that have been and are trawling the archives of the General Conference and going through the manuscripts of the White Estate, gaining their own copies for the purposes of maintaining independent custody of the words that she put onto paper. In fact, I just want to comment also here that I have actually seen situations where certain people have changed the words of Ellen White so it means something significantly different to what she has intended and this coming from within the mainstream Adventism itself. Okay, now Paul refers to the confidence we can have based upon witnesses. If we go and take a look at Hebrews 12, we'd see the obvious uh, so see the following observation, not obvious, sorry, observation. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice here, cloud of witnesses. What does that mean? Or what does that imply? It means a huge number. We then continue, I'll see if we can, sorry, oh, I'm at my last slide, but uh, yeah, uh, must be getting close to the end. We then continue, and the apostle speaks of Christ's resurrection in the same way. And he that was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, then after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen to sleep. So at the time that he was resurrected, it wasn't just the disciples, but over 500 other people who got to see him, in may possibly in some kind of meeting, but they saw him and they saw him alive. There were just too many for anyone to be able to say, well, you're just deluding yourself. One of the things that we will always have to bear in mind is that despite the multiplicity of evidence supporting the veracity of the scriptures, that there will be always room for doubt. Now, before you consider how terrible that is, consider the following. God is a God of freedom. Free choice is extended to all. Freedom to believe, freedom to disbelieve, freedom to do good, freedom to do evil. If God were to take away all room for doubt, then one of the freedoms which mankind values, the freedom to disbelieve would be taken away from us and that would go against his nature. So where are we now? We have just completed a short introduction to the history of the scriptures. And I'm going to have to leave, until next time, a study into the King James Bible proper and investigate its story and consider the powerful impact it has had on society over the last 410 words. May God add his blessing to this sermon. Let us close this sermon with a word of prayer. And dear Lord, we are so grateful that you have protected your word in the way that you have shown us this morning that we can have confidence in the word that is before us that the charges of corruption against it can fall flat and we want to thank you that uh, you have done this and we pray that as we continue to study our word that our 
our confidence in you will continue to increase and that we will be worthy for your kingdom when you come to take your people home, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Recording stopped. Okay. Any comments or questions? Yeah, I'd like to say something, um, George. Go ahead. Um, there's there's a misconception about um, Mrs. White's writings about her using other translations. And uh, she used uh, King James Version when she wrote her books. And what happened was when there was so much excitement um, about the new um, revision of the KJV as it was thought, and they, it was well, widely advertised that the King James Version was going to be re revised, and uh, it was put out in 1890, I think it was, as a review uh, revised version. Right. And people in the review office were actually republishing Mrs. White's books and putting, taking KJV quotes and putting um, revised version quotes in there. Uh, about what, do you know what year that was? Uh, I, it was after 1890 when the, when the revised version came out. And I was at some meeting once and somebody read a statement uh, that Mrs. White wrote somewhere. Yeah. Uh, she said that I would like to know who it is in the review office who have taken it upon themselves to supplant my King James Version quotations uh, with the revised version. And she did talk uh, um, about things were happening in the review office. She said, I can't uh, divulge them right now because these things are still being revealed to me. But she said, um, changes are being uh, happening in the review office. And we, she did talk about books of a new order that would be produced in the future. And we saw Mrs. White's books uh, that were sort of like, um, what do you call it? Um, compilations? Uh, yeah, compilations, yeah. And so you get bits and pieces from letters and sermons and everything put together and you can make Mrs. White say things that she didn't actually really mean. Yeah. So, yeah, so it came to my remembrance there about the, the Bible verses that people often have said, oh, Mrs. White used other translations. But actually, in fact, she really didn't. And it only appears that she did. Right. Yeah. So that, that, that's very interesting information that you've just given. And I'd be m very interested to try and chase up that particular quote. Uh, yeah. Because uh, if we can get the exact wording of it, we can usually hit the um, hit the Googles and uh, and s see if we can find out more information. Yeah, well, some of these quotes are, 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 can be difficult to find because they're but in you, some oh, yeah, I'm aware of that. location. Yeah, mm. you know, like sometimes Mrs. White travelled around. Uh, well, of course, she travelled around everywhere, but she came up in Australia, for instance. She'd travel around to different places, like she came up to Toowoomba here in Queensland, and she was. Uh, doing sermons and she talked about caves that were going to be re, um, opened up to God's people in the last days. She talked about caves in the Watergans out the back of Avondale yes. down there that revealed. But to actually find these quotations um, where they were written down, I don't know. I have heard them spoken over the years. But um, my parents they, actually referred to the caves in the Watergans, and 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 and, and uh, when I, when they were talking about it, we actually lived. Uh, at um, just opposite where the Raring Power Station now is. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no. So, we, we, yeah, some of these things are difficult to track down, but um, but somebody's found them some time at some point. Well, the, 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 they must exist because you know my parents spoke of it, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually um, some people. Oh, I went to Avondale um, for a year. Mm. And I remember um, somebody talking about these, this, some guys that were um, in the way out the back of Wadigans there somewhere um, in the hills. They found this massive cave. Yes. And it was so huge, it had an ocean in it. And they said you could sail a, sail a ship around in there. Oh, they really? Some, some scrub. There was some scrub that they were bush bashing around, and they came across this bit of a hole in this hillside. Yeah. And they went, in, and went there, and they must have had torches or something. And they said they couldn't believe how huge this place was. Um, but then later on, they wanted to show some people where it was, but they couldn't find it again. So they lost lost the location of it. And um, yeah, we heard that story when I was at Avondale at, at some point. 
Yeah, well, um, uh, one of the things that my, my father maintained, he said um, that he was of the view, uh, he didn't actually try and quote anybody in this uh, situation, but he was of the view that some of these caves are currently closed to human sight. Um, and <clears throat> that, get, that can mean a number of things. It means that you can't see them, but it can also mean that they are, are physically closed off and they're not detectable. And uh, he, he maintains that uh, at the appropriate time there will be earthquakes that will crack open the earth in the right spot and open up those caves. Yes, yes. So, um, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had a lot of respect for my old man and, um, and, and his... Uh, and his take on on a lot of things, and that was certainly one of those uh, things that that I always remember. Mm. Well, mm. you know, when I was at Avondale College mm. back in 1981. Um, oh, you they, must have been you must have been there when I was there because I was there uh, in '81. Were you? Mm. Wow. I was, I was doing. Oh, okay, righty. Wow. You look look up your look up your Rana and your Jackarani. You'll probably yeah. find my ugly oh. dial in there. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, I, you you would have remembered then when they had this school, they, they had the big meeting in the in the in the hall there, and um, they said that we have the new replacement, a, a new Bible for our modern times, and uh, that was so at the had, NIV or something like that. Yeah, and uh, I specifically remember before that time um, being going to the Raring camp when they still had the Raring camp. And uh, the uh, one of the one of the ministers there, and he was one that I had in high regard. He uh, was uh, telling us uh, how good the new international version was, and it was on account of his recommendations. I actually went and got one. Hmm. Yeah, well, they handed them out to all the students. Yeah. In the hall there, yeah. and uh, I, I, uh, but I could never because I was like uh, fourteen years old when I was introduced to the truth and yeah. I had the King James version stuck in my head but when I tried to I'd read the NIV I found it lifeless I didn't feel the spirit of God through it mm. and it, it, it had too much disjointedness about it it, it like I had uh, it would drop the, instead of have flowing like the KJV flows yeah but the NIV has got these sort of drop-offs in it and, and it just, just hasn't got that spirit in it and mm. so I couldn't. I ended up having to put the NIV down and go back to my King James version because it, was, it seemed very lifeless to me. And I've never, you know, my wife she used the uh, NIV, uh, the revol uh, what do you call it, the New King James version. Yeah. And and she because she's Pakistani and she found that it was probably a bit better English. You mean a bit I, easier to comprehend? Reading, yeah. Yeah, she'd be reading it and I'd be saying, well, "Wait a minute, the Bible doesn't say that, Esther." And she said, "What do you mean?" I said. It says this, and then she'd be read, she'd read other verses, and I said, "But it doesn't say that." And then I realised that the King New King James Version is really a a counterfeit of the King James Version. Uh, they, they taught, yeah, look, to, all anything post eighteen ninety is based on uh, Westcott and Hort's work. Yes, yes, yes. So I mean, my wife went back to the King James Version, and she she finds it no problem now. But, right, you know, at least the New King James Version is the best alternative to the King James Version, if you like. But I can't, I can't use it. No, it's just there's too much, too much changes made in it. Yeah, uh, they, yeah. They, they took, they took the these and theirs out of it. They took a lot more out of it than these and theirs. And 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 the thing is, um, and this is something that um, a lot of people are not aware of, the terms thee and thou were put there deliberately by the by the um, translators. If you go and take a look at the, the, the prefaces put in by the translators explaining their, their um, operation of uh, doing the um, King James Version, there is no thee and thou in any of those uh, prefaces. Mm. They use you and your. And you and your does exist in the King James Bible re uh, and some people might be a bit surprised to know this. Now, so the question you've got to ask yourself was, what's the difference between you and your and thee and thou? The simple difference is that thee and thou is singular. 
So when God is spoken of, thou alone art mighty. What are they? What's what's the person trying to say? They are trying to say singular, thou God alone. If it said you, it would be <coughs> talking plural. Hey George. Yes. Um, it's uh, it's very interesting, you know, like uh, at you and I, uh, all these uh, brothers and sisters in our meeting today, we are the one that going to preserve the spirit of prophecy. Because uh, you know, like I'm writing, um, I'm reading a book called Letters to the Church, and how the the uh, what you call it, Ellen White Estate, sold into the evangelical uh, Christian Church in 1956 and 1957. Mm -hmm. uh, how they start to changing the the major part of the spirit of prophecy, and but you and I are here today and we hear these things and we search these things that God put us in this place in order to preserve the spirit of prophecy. I know for a fact that the greatest uh, attack in this last day, not to the Bible itself, but to the spirit of prophecy, because the spirit of prophecy, it's leading people to the Bible, to the word of God. Well, that's and, right. Yeah. And some of the things that's been changing from the uh Ellen White estate, it's it's a big shame to, you know, because Ellen White, before she passed away in 1915, she gave the trust to Ellen White estate in order to look after her writing mm -hmm. and put it out there for God's people. But even the, uh, the, the council itself that Ellen White trusted in those days are no longer what will be trusted with her writing in nowadays. Well, and... It, it comes back to uh, a term that I stumbled across, and I actually mentioned it in the um, during part of the sermon, but it went through so quickly you might have missed it. D are you a King James onlyist or a scholarship onlyist? Do you get the, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Because essentially what they're saying is that you can choose as your source of authority the Bible. Or the opinions of men. That's essentially what it's saying. And a lot of people, regrettably, have gone with the opinions of men. Yeah, and and if you do, uh, I did a few searches on uh, on a, on the app. You know, the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White. Uh, I think number two, uh, Ellen White. I did a few searches, and the whole the whole statement is being omitted. The whole thing is being deleted from 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 that uh, what you call it up uh, from that uh app app Ellen White that we're using now and there's so many of them mm. and there's so so many of them yes um there's a very interesting story of a ah, this might be it no um there was a Jewish man I think he might have even been uh, a Jewish rabbi. Um, he, and I'm trying to find his name, but uh, he existed um, a while ago. And he said that he wanted nothing to do with Christianity. Uh, and he gave a number of awful experiences of the way Christians had treated the Jewish people. And if you had just presented to him ah that might be it Joe Kagan I think it is let me just take a look um, just have a quick look at that I think it, it might be it might be him um, anyway he was hard against the Christian Christ, Christian Bible and he stumbled across Ellen White's writings. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Joe Kagan was his name. And uh, I'll just read briefly what he had to say. I can blow it up. Actually, I'll do one better. I'll I'll blow it up and, and I'll actually share it with you. So if you pin my video again, you can take a quick look. So he had a very negative attitude towards Christianity. He would never touch the New Testament. 
but he knew the Jewish Old Testament extremely well, as a highly educated rabbi would. One day he got hold of the book called Patriarchs and Prophets by Ellen White. He read it with astonishment and wanted to know who this Ellen White was. That is when I met him. He was asking who is this Ellen White and what university did she attend? We told him she only had a third grade education. Then where did she learn Hebrew, he asked. We told him she never knew Hebrew, but was the most prolific female writer in history and that this was only one of her books. He was amazed at her knowledge, saying that the information in this book, Patriarchs and Prophets, is Mishnaic. The Mishnah is part of the Hebrew scholarship. He said the Mishnah had only been translated into English 30 years ago and that only high-level rabbis knew this information. This is the history of my people and it is very accurate. He also said you have to know Hebrew to be able to write like this because her sentence structure is not English, it's Hebrew. The rhythm, the meter, the arrangement of the words and the expressions are not English. He said it's as if she wrote in Hebrew and it was translated into English. You know, the interesting thing is that um, in 1956 and 1957, two evangelical s scholars came into the Ellen White estate. Uh, I don't know whether you heard of the name Barn House, uh, Dr. Barn House. Yes, yes. He was Martin. the guy that wrote uh, uh, the book about cults, wasn't he? And yeah, and, and they came over to the church and asked the church which, which side you belong to, whether you belong to the cult or you belong to a Christian. But what what is so sad about our our leadership in you know on the general conference, they they sold their soul to the evangelical and well, um, the thing that's interesting even, there is that they the, even called Ellen White a lunatic, you know, and uh, it's that, I've just uh, Pi just put a question, what's the rabbi's name? I've just put a link up to the article so you can yeah. go straight to it if you want to read it. So uh, oh, hang on. I'm sorry. I've put it to one person. I'll have to do it again. Um, somehow, I, I'll just... Uh, sorry, I just realised. There you go. There's a link to the article, so you can re have a read of it yourself and uh, see what you've got to say. Now, continue, uh, brother. Yeah, and... Uh, but they they trying to subtly change in order for Seventh-day Adventists to be called Christian in the Christian world, they have to change some of our, our beliefs and and one of the beliefs that he have to change is the atonement in the 18, 1844 message that we've been preached a sanctuary message mm. and and our our ministers and our presidents and leaders in that time sold their soul to to the evangelical and they make a change from there by writing that book question on doctrines have any of you um, heard of uh, David Bauer? Um, I, I, I the name, but I can't remember how in in yeah. what relation. Okay, uh, David Bauer was a minister of the gospel, and uh, I stumbled across some of his stuff. Ah, oh, here we go. In I would recommend that you have a listen to his stuff. Um, where is it? Oh, here we go. David Bauer, questions on doctrine, the new questions on doctrine. I would recommend you have a listen to his um, things. I'll put the, I'll put a link up there for you to, to go to. Um, his stuff is down at the bottom part of the page and he's got about five audios of him doing his presentations. Um, brother, brother Elvis Placer has actually met David Bow. I don't know if he's still alive, but um, hey. George, I, sorry, I can act, you, sorry. Can you um, uh, what's the spelling of Bauer? B A U E R. Uh, look, or no, no, you don't have to worry. I put a link up to the directly to the audio, and it's B A U E R. Just in case you need to know. Yeah, because I was uh, on the phone rather than on the computer. Yeah, that's fine. You just click on the link and, and your phone should give you the internet, um, um, should take you straight to the internet. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I, I when I heard his stuff, I thought to myself, 
is it possible that you can come across men that are so serious with the truth but the poor gentleman ended up being disfellowshipped from the church and as best as I can tell when he did his presentation she had already been disfellowshipped from the church uh, yeah Any other comments? Well, before people go, I, I just announced, <clears throat> as I announced before, if anybody wants to do a catch up um, lesson on number two, I'll come on at four o'clock today. And I presume, unless somebody else wants to arrange a time, we usually close Sabbath with our group. So, unless people want to come on earlier, so I'll come on at 7 30 because here in Melbourne, Sabbath finishes about 10 to 8. Mm. So, if people want to come in early, they can, but I'll. I'll come in on 7.30 if nobody else opens up the meeting. Did, did, did you, any of you guys hear a slight ringing tone when uh, I was preaching today? As I was preaching, I kept hearing a bit of a, a bit of a, um, you know, like an amplifier ring. Well, it was actually, you, you had the volume up quite loud. So All I, right. I had to turn the volume down quite a bit. Yeah. So it wasn't ringing quite loud. It was, it was probably a little bit of ringing probably because it was so loud. Hmm. Mm. I found you. I found you too in this uh, book. Oh yes, yep, yep. I remember Go that on, one. Show us. Uh, well, I don't know if you can see there. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah, I recognise it. Where were you, David? Hey. Huh? Where were you in that? Evan College. Oh, did you say how? What did you say? Did you say how am I? Now, where are you in that book? Where's your picture in that book? Oh, that's this is Avondale um, College in 1981. Jack Aranda. This is me. Um, uh, oh yeah. In, uh, in yeah. 19, well, that was when I had hair. Yeah. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> so you actually had to go off and check to see if I really was there. <laughs> Yeah, there you I, go. I was free and free. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now I remember your face now. When I when I did that. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> it's quite interesting that back in those days I had a far more progressive um, attitude towards religious things as uh, compared to what I do now. Yes. Hmm. Actually, my first sermon on Basewater Fellowship was about that particular uh, topic about how my attitudes. Uh, have changed from the progressive ones that I used to have to the conservative ones I hold now. Wow. Mm. Did you become a teacher? Uh, I did some teaching, but I never really became a teacher. Okay. I didn't I didn't finish my qualification at Avondale. I ended up doing a science qualification up in uh, Central Queensland University a few years later. Wow. And I got my degree for that. Then I got a graduate diploma in computers and then I recently well more recently got a master's in computer networking and security can I ask a question George yes you gave us alternatives or and correct me if I misunderstood you of, of the Bible or scholarship is that correct yes uh, Bible only or scholarship only well, shouldn't we have a combination of that because we should be having the Bible only? Well, you see, we're, we looking also, at two, we're, we're looking at two extremes, aren't we? Scholarship because, yeah. unless we? because if we're going only by a translation, what, no matter which one you're referring to, we need to have a combination of the Bible in association with scholarship, I would believe, because we can't, we can't afford to have uh, a translation of, of an te original text without scholarship. I think that's mm. dangerous too. I think what we got this is this is why I said this is only uh, um, I, you know yeah. I thought this was just going to be a single sermon yeah and um, you know it was only on Wednesday night that I realized that I was going to have a sermon this weekend but the thing that's interesting as I as I started developing this sermon it was like somebody else was pushing the pen yeah the the yeah. thing I mean that, that this sermon that I produced was 
Uh, 4,500 words, uh, and I knock that together in, in, in two days. Now, normally, it takes me a day for a 1,000 words when I'm producing anything in of, of this kind of um, uh, quality. So to be able to pump out 4,000 words in two days, and mind you, some of it is quotations, but to be able to put it together that quickly... It's just not the norm for me, so I believe it was um, there was some inspired help there, um, uh, and and uh, I'd like to, I want to go and focus more on the time around sixteen hundred eleven because it's I think it's going to be very interesting for us to take a look at how the translators operated and what they did. And uh, when they came up to the time of their um, actually putting together the King James Bible. Yeah. Mm. But uh, yeah, no, no, it's a valid point. Uh, as you as you can probably notice, what I was doing is presenting two extremes. Yes, but I'm yeah. just saying, I, to me, you need both. You need to take the authority of the scripture, but when you're relying on any transver translation including the King James Version, if you're ignoring Bible scholarship, you're also in a wrong position as far as I, I take mm. it. Because, for example, um, some of you know that I, in the not too distant past, purchased a 1560 modern spelling of the Geneva Bible. Yep. And if you've got a King James Version with marginal notes saying what the original Hebrew and the Greek meaning, in many instances, the, the Geneva Bible is closer to the original text or text meaning of those words than the King James is. So, I mean, mm. that's what I'm saying. We need to be open to Bible scholarship. And that, that's why it is that I will uh, also look in, we will also look into the, um, the prefaces by the scholars because the, the, the prefaces by the scholars will give us some clue as to the motivations and uh, what have you of the... Um, of the the team that put together the King James Bible, yes, yes. Mm. I think I think it's worth our while getting to know those kinds of things. So yes. that was just another. Oh, sorry. That'll that'll be uh, um, put together in a future sermon. Yeah, and just another interesting point relating to what you said. You talk about the Calvinistic lens of the Geneva Bible. Well, um, if you weren't aware, there was the original 1561, but I think they also revised it in about 1599. And it says that the 1599 one is actually more Calvinistic in its in, in its wording than the than the 1561. So mm. I I saw a a video on YouTube before I purchased mine, and they did show some comparisons between the texts. So it, it seemed to me that the 1599 one became Cal, more Calvinistic in its in its translation to support Calvinism rather than the 1561. So yeah. Again, it goes back to which version of that, you, which 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 one of the Geneva Bible you're going by too. <laughs> yeah, I, I I hear. Yeah. Yeah, George. Um, the if anybody wants to read, have a look at if they can get hold of this magazine here, you probably know it by Jack Check Publications. Oh yes, yep. It talks about the sabotage of the King James Version Bible and mm. how. The Romanists sent their agents into the universities to to uh, destroy the credibility of the King James Version in the minds of the theological students, and they showed it how they did it. They even got into our colleges, and they had the Alberta Rivera explained now, how they got. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, there, there is a book that I also stumbled across, and that this is where I got that expression: King James onlyism versus scholarship onlyism. Um, I'm just trying to find out where it was now. Um, just have, uh, take a quick look. Ah, oh, here we go. Um, King James onlyism. Uh, hang on. Versus scholarship onlyism. Okay, that's. Let me just see if that's the actual title. Yeah, yeah, that's the title of the book. It's written by Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, and he goes into. Uh, it's about 120 pages. He goes into a lot of detail about the um, about some of the things that they they said. I was going to go into some of the deceptions that uh, they used because he men mentioned seven deceptions. Uh, 
I actually, yeah, I actually took these out, and I'll, I will bring them up. But uh, the, one of the one of the uh, deceptions he said is, uh, when deceiving someone, two thirds of what he says is true. This is the devil. Now I don't know how he got that, um, but he gave a number of uh, passages, which. Uh, we can take a look at. He said Genesis chapters, it looks like chapters 2 and 3, Isaiah 28, 20 Psalms 119, 1 Corinthians 1 to 3, Proverbs 8, 18 and 30. So those are obviously chapters, I'd say. But he said they should be memorised by any layman who wishes to escape the plague being spread by today by Christian colleges, etc. So... But his first premise is that there is a devil, Satan, he is primarily interested in what God says. And I, I'd probably accept that because when um, his first words, the first words out of his mouth when he spoke to Eve was, did God say that you shouldn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Or something to that effect. So I find that rather interesting. Could you repeat what you just said? I didn't quite take it in. The first question that the devil asked of Eve. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? All right. So the devil is interested in what God has said. But he yeah. puts it as a question. And I, I'm curious, why would he put it as a question when he knows very jolly well what exactly what God did say? Well, to me, questions are important in, if you want to get people to think about something. That's so fair you, enough in today's so, world. So you're not actually, you're not just saying something which they either accept or reject, but when you ask it as a question, you're actually getting them to consider what you've said and maybe think about it and maybe answer it. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that, that's fair enough in today's world, but at that time they had perfect memories. But he still asked a question. <laughs> but he still asked a question. And do you notice what, what happened straight after uh, uh, in response? Uh, well, she, well, she, she answered the question, but then she added to the Bible. She now, did. you read in Genesis 3 3, but if the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, and that's go back sorry. to the, sorry. No, you finish, and I want to say something. So, if you that. go back to the words of God, He didn't say you shall not touch it. He just said you shall not eat of it. And there's an interesting um, conversation I've had with some here. I, I know Brother Levine. I've talked with him about this, and and um, what you know did actually was Eve actually quoting what God said and wasn't written anywhere else. But let me point out, uh, the Lord's brought to my attention that three times in Genesis, we find the Lord himself speaking as to what, he, what instruction he gave. And in none of those three times when he's speaking himself, did he say about not touching it? The only reference that he, that God gives when he's speaking is actually not eating of it. So that, that's, that's right. That's, that's why I believe that Eve's words of not touching, not touching it, were her own conception, and they weren't true. And I'll just give you quickly, if you like, the three references where God Himself is speaking, and He doesn't make any mention of um, of of touching it. He, his command was simply not to eat of it. And we have the original one in um, Genesis two verse seventeen, where He's saying. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So that's the Lord speaking. That's right. Genesis 3 has Eve adding those words. That that's wasn't right. the Lord speaking. And as then soon as she down, did that, the devil had her. Yeah. But then you go down to Genesis 3, verse 11. The Lord again is speaking. And hear what he says here. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee? that thou shouldest not eat. Yes. Again, when, when he is speaking, he doesn't mention anything about touching. That's right. And again, in verse, um, in, in Genesis 3, 17, the Lord is speaking himself. Does he mention anything about touching it? No, he doesn't. And he's, because he says, and unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife 
and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So when we hear what the word is, the Lord is saying three times in Genesis, mm. he never mentions uh, touching it. It's That's only, right. It's only Eve's words adding the word touch. You, so I think, you, so I think, three, so you, I think three times the Lord speaking is over, outweighs the mm. idea that what yeah. what Eve is saying. You, you've you've um, you've made an observation that I had not seen myself, and um, thank you for that. Which one was that, George? The fact that uh, God spoke three times of his command to not eat the fruit, but at no time did he mention not touching. No, it was only Eve that said that. It was only Eve and that Ella, said and, that. And, and, and in Ellen White's later writing, she actually talks about Eve's added words. Sometimes in the earlier writing, she probably was going by maybe a, co a common concept with Pipka say that, you know, it was actually Reeve saying God's words. But uh, at later on, she actually makes it quite clear that Eve added those words, and they weren't. They were not the real words of God. So yeah. Ellen White confirms that. Yeah, yeah. George. Yes. Simple question. Go ahead. Why? Why do we have so many different translations? Okay. Do you want my answer? Because my answer is more speculation than anything else. Try it. All right, I'll give it. I'll throw it out there. If you don't want someone to be able to get to the get to the genuine, what is one way of preventing them from doing so? You're giving them many choices. Multiple you give you give them many fakes that appear very close to the genuine. Yeah, but what is the was the main reason? Why did they come out with so many different? translation well that that's Babylon my, is confusion that, that's my Babylon only confusion yeah that's my only speculation and I think Christopher Hitchens and, also mentioned it right towards the very end where where he spoke of a Babel of Bibles okay what happened during the dark ages uh, there was an attempt to um, essentially keep the Bible from the, the, the masses well, what about burning the Bibles Would, there it, was that too who had that I uh, just the, the, anyone anyone wanted to get rid of the Bible, the Word of God, completely. Yeah, I just stumbled across this book here. Yeah, I read it too. Yes, you've seen this one. Yep, I read it. Okay, in the back, there was reference to another book, and I actually, I was sitting here this morning, and I turned around, and just behind me, you can see this wall of books, and it was just down in the bottom corner. I just saw this Battle of the Bibles. I thought. <laughs> I haven't seen this before and anyway in it there was a um, an, he refers to another book he's got I don't know if you can see this one I'll just hold it up and oh, dear me. can you see the title it says hold on, just give me a moment I'll, go, I'll pin you so I can see you yeah inquisitive uh, Christians oh uh, no I don't know I'm not sure about that one. all right I'll read that one to you the inquisitive Christians and essentially he goes through the history of the uh, um, the books of the Bible as uh, taken by Thomas to uh, the Indian subcontinent and how the Roman church got in there and tried to destroy every single copy of the Bible that was in uh, around India. Is that by the same author as the... By yeah, the same the author. Oh, yes. I, I think I read years ago something about the uh, that what you're talking about, but probably by a different author, I think. I'm not sure now, but too long ago to remember. Mm -hmm. So the point is the enemy wanted to destroy the word of God completely and uh, God had ways to preserve it because it says in a, it's a promise in the Bible that God will preserve his word. Exactly. They couldn't achieve this and they could see that they're fighting with, with, with the Lord. Yep. So they came with another strategy yep. which they thought it would be more effective mm -hmm. and they started mistranslating. Now in order to uh, copyright the, a book. If I'm correct, I heard it somewhere that there should be at least thirty percent changes than the original. This is the only way. Yeah, that... yeah. Look, I, I think one would have to look up the legislation in that matter. Yeah, well, 
whatever it is, 10% or 20 or 30, doesn't matter. It can be 5%, okay? Yeah. But now, if we have so many Bibles, different translations, that means that each one has to be different than every other one. Yeah. No, in order to be copyrighted, okay? Yeah. Now, something that is copyrighted, just get this, we will not be able to use because we will not have license in a, in a time of trouble and so on because like they working now on the seeds yeah Monsanto seeds uh, genetically modified seeds so That's this right. is, this is genetically modified word of god okay mm -hmm. it's a human uh, perverted ideas entered into the scripture and uh, we need to be uh, um, we need to watch out uh, peter date he has a lot to say about new English change version. Yeah. We cannot defend Adventist truth from from the new King James. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gail Ripplinger, uh, I think she's still alive, uh, Baptist uh, professor. She said that um, new international version is actually Luciferian Bible. And I came across uh, seven Adventist pastors that actually they were studying and reading New International uh, Version. As so a source of authority or as a way of trying to find out what it really says? Uh, well, I, I did ask personally a pastor in South Africa which Bible he uh, is recommending. He yep. said uh, his Bible is uh, New International Version. This oh, Bible. okay. So it's a source of authority. Yes, and I, <laughs> I had many Bibles and I checked them and I was amazed. Some of the differences, it's, it's beyond imagination. One well, time in the United States, I had my beautiful New King James Version, leather band, maroon color. And uh, here there was a Sabbath school and they were reading something from King James Version. And I couldn't find this verse, and I said, well, "What's going on?" And this is when I was alerted to do more research. And uh, my little, can I make someone first? Sorry, Please. what was that, Lisa? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was talking to my daughter and I said, do you want to make some lunch for us? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I thought you were good. jumping in. Um, I was just going to say... Um, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen Walter Weiss's uh, uh, two-part presentation uh, called The Battle of the Bibles, uh, which I, I'm, I'm assuming that he must have, uh, must have had this book as, as part of his, um, as part of his uh, uh, inspiration for the title of his uh, presentations. But he, one, one of the things, big takeaways I got from from his Battle of the Bible presentation was it seemed to be the primary objective of the powers that be to weaken the force of the claims, of the biblical claims that Jesus is Messiah. Uh, yes, and uh, probably most of you or some of you have read the statements in the Spirit of Prophecy that the Bibles will be taken away from us. So the only Bible which we have, what we memorize, and yep. when we when we do your, when you do your best, especially when you um, progress with age, you memorize the verse from the King James version, and then you try to repeat it in other version, and it doesn't work. No, somehow it doesn't work. Well, and have you noticed that? It's, and it's actually causing confusion if somebody is reciting the verse from King James Version yeah. and someone else has a Bible, other Bible, then it's causing confusion. Well, have you noticed if, if you sit in a church where multiple versions of Bibles are in existence, somebody at the front will get people to open up the Bible to a particular verse and get it to get them to read it out. And, and how it sounds in the church, it just sounds like confusion. It's like a like people at a, a at a uh, you know a reception and they're all talking and they're all saying their own thing you can't distinguish the various words whereas back in the old days well, at least when I was a teenager the, the King James Bible still largely reigned king uh, that was just before uh, 
before the other version started to make their way in significant um, incursions into the Adventist church. But they all, a lot of those, the modern translations all stem from the work of West Cotton Port, um, who worked in secret, they worked in secret for 10 years. And uh, even the Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witness Bible are using West Cotton Port's material to put yeah. it together. And we had some lady come to our church uh, at, when I was at this church um, um, wanting us to donate money for the Russian Bibles. And so I said to her afterwards, I said, what translation is this Russian Bible from? And she said, oh, it's just, I don't know. And I said, well, could you read to me uh, Revelation 1.10 for me, please? So she read it out. And at the Revelation 1.10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's Day. She read it out. And she said, I was on, in the spirit on Sunday. Yeah, and that was the Russian Bible. So you know what? What? What other things are in these foreign translations which are completely abhorrent to what was originally uh, given to us? Similar kinds of things are happening to Ellen White's translations into Chinese language and um, various things like that as well. It seems. Okay, and spirit of prophecy as well. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Did one of them lost his speech. Uh, the one who the the ones who are translating the coming out with a new international version. I think one of them the lost he lost his speech. Yeah, but well, the thing that's interesting about Westcott and Hort is that neither of them were Christians. One was a spiritualist, and the other one was uh, followed some other kind of um, religious leaning, but it was definitely not Christian. And my, my general thinking is this uh, would you go to a fat person to ask them how to diet and get more healthy I don't think so you wouldn't well, because, because whatever away. advice they give is obviously not working for them you stay and, away from fat doctors and, and the, in, the same, in the same way would you ask a pagan how to accept Jesus Christ as Saviour? Well, I don't think so because they don't know. Well, this is why it says the whole world wanders after the beast because they don't know any other way. They don't know the way of salvation. So they, they have to follow someone mm. even if they don't know where it's leading them. Yeah. That's the problem. I did read in some book, I don't remember where I read it, but that King James Version is the only Bible which is written with a, in a legal language. And King James Version has a dictionary grafted in it, or filled in, in it. If you don't, oh, understand, yeah. if you don't understand the word, you just keep reading, it will be used in a different context, and God will explain to you the meaning of the word in your language. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, you've just reminded me of a series of videos. I'm just going to see if I can find it. Where's my playlist? Uh, here we go. Um, no, not that one. Oh, here we go. All right. Now, for those that are interested... This is a study on the King James Bible. I will put a link in the chat to it. And it talks about the built-in dictionary and a few other things. Uh, just give me a moment. Ah, I'm just noticing the video is all jumpy and it makes it feel as if the... There we go. All right, to everyone. Come on. There we go. Right. Okay, I've just put a link to a playlist and the whole playlist is built around the premise of the King James Bible built-in dictionary. Okay. Now the other one, which is also very interesting, the same guy has produced a playlist of about 19 videos that's associated with King James Bible grammar and punctuation. But these will take quite a while to listen to, and I would recommend you do. In fact, uh, by the time you're done with those, you'll probably know as much about the King James presentations as what I'm planning to 
present next time I preach a sermon. You know, George, um, the, the, when you, people, if you just look at uh, Cardinal, uh, sorry, uh, Westcott and Hort, yeah. it, it, people realise that behind Westcott and Hort was Cardinal Newman and Cardinal Wiseman. Now, Cardinal Newman presented himself to the Pope. He said, I had this, I had this uh, idea to take the hated KJV Bible off the Protestants. And the Pope said, oh, I'm all ears. Tell me the story. He said, we're going to revise, put out a new translation and, and advertise it as a revision of the KJV. But it's not a, a revision of the KJV. It's actually based upon the um, minority manuscripts. And right. so he said, that's why West Cotton Port worked in secret for 10 years. And then they were advertising that this new Bible was coming out revision. Yeah. But um, because, yeah, so that, that were these two Roman Catholic cardinals working in harmony with West Cotton Port to destroy the KJV. Yeah, I'd heard about heard about that. You see, the thing is, any, any spiritual things that are going to bring us to Christ that were done outside the control of the Roman Catholic Church is what they're trying to uh, destroy. And that's what I alluded to in my sermon, that they're after the King James Version and they're after the Spirit of Prophecy because those were produced outside the control of the Roman Catholic Church. And so because for, for the Adventists, they have to destroy the authority of both. As a matter of interest, have people heard of Ivan Hannon and his numerical translations? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's quite interesting. Um, I got that all oh, some time ago, and um, in one of the prefaces, it just said that maybe he found Westcott and Hort's text more accurate, but I don't know about that. But that's only what somebody commenting. But the fact is that um, you know, as we know, with the changes that have taken place in the Bible according to what he did um you, you know those most of those you know what do you call them things that we find missing and you know people claim weren't genuine he actually through his system he claims that they are genuine so it was interesting to note that you know by whatever system he was using he 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 claimed that uh, well he found that those things were should have been in the scriptures where we we are saying you know uh, with after you know west Coast horse and all that sort of thing Bibles often leave these things out. I think there was, there was one exception that he that he that he did he, he didn't think was genuine, but mostly <coughs> he claims through his system that those things that are in dispute were genuine according to his system. <coughs> so I found that rather interesting. Yeah, yeah. I would like to share two verses from the Bible. Can I do that? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Oh, well, George, you're on mute. We can't hear you, George. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. it's. I, think, I really think they are very important verses. First one is Isaiah 58, 12. Um, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of that breach the restorer of paths to dwell in the next one is jeremiah 6 16. i really think that these are instructions for god's people especially in the last days thus said the lord stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But it says about uh, further about Israel, but they said, we will not walk therein. And these are actually prophetic words because many people don't want to walk in the, on the old paths. So I think these, these things are important to know. Hmm. And uh, thank you for your time, and uh, I need to depart. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you. Okay, well, happy, uh, happy Sabbath. Yeah. Thanks, you, Rick. Hmm.
All right. Hang on. There's something that Serena put in there. No, I don't, that's not me. <laughs> oh, isn't it you? Was there something? Oh, okay. What are your thoughts about the books that are not included in the Bible? And so, in other words, you're talking about the Apocrypha. Um, I did have some thoughts on it. I don't have any right now. Um, just give me a moment. I should be able to come together with some thoughts on it. Because the AB, the um, King James, uh, was in the Apocrypha. Uh, did have the apocrypha in it sorry that's right um, you will find and you will, and in the original printing of the king james versions but uh, you will find okay marginal, marginal right. references to some of those works as well um I, I i read an article a little while back and i've accepted it at face value um <clears throat> i'll just read a little bit of it here for you first in the days in which our bible was translated apocrypha accepted reading based on its historical value though not as accept they're not accepted as scripture by anyone outside of the catholic church the king james translators place it between the old and the new testaments for its historical benefit to its readers they did not integrate it into the old testament text as to do the corrupt alexandrian manuscripts that they rejected the Apocrypha's divine is very obvious by the seven which they gave for not incorporating it into the text, and they are as follows. Not one of them is in the Hebrew language, which was alone used by the inspired historians and poets of the Old Testament. Not one of the writers lays any claim to inspiration. So number three, these books were never acknowledged as sacred scriptures by the Jewish church, and therefore were never sanctioned by our Lord. They were not allowed a place among the sacred books during the first four centuries of the Christian church. They contain fabulous statements and statements which contradict not only the canonical scriptures but themselves as when in the two books of Maccabees Antiochus Epiphanes is made to die three different deaths in as many different places. The Apocrypha inculcates doctrines at variance with the Bible, such as prayers for the dead and sinless perfection. It teaches immoral practices such as lying, suicide, assassination and magical incantations. The Book of Enoch wasn't in in the apocrypha is it can't tell you um no just a, a seminar of lady had a uh she's getting all excited about the book of enoch and she right i think she did a sermon at one of the churches on it and uh so i i, I said well, can i have a look at it so i had a look at it and it was coming up with these really stupid statements like oh when where the sun sets it's it sets in the land of fire and everything in that country is on fire and everything like that. And it sounded just like uh, real pagan type of thinking. Um, yep. Uh, it didn't okay. sound... You know. Here's the list of books that are in the Apocrypha. The first book of Adam and Eve, the second book of Adam and Eve, the book of the secrets of Enoch. So it oh, looks yeah. like it was there. The Psalms of Solomon, the Odes of Solomon, the Letters of Aristides, Fourth Book of Maccabees, The Story of Ahika, Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, Testament of Reuben, Testament of Simeon, Testament of Levi, and then we've got Testament of the following, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Joseph, Benjamin. And that should be in total 16 books, if I, if I, what else I've read is in go by one. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Oh, more than that. Seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. If I've counted that correctly. Are all what you, are all what you're quoting, the apocrypha only, or are they other texts that, that in addition to the apocrypha? Um. Okay. 
because yeah. they've only shown on. one that. Hang on, let me let me think about this. Uh, because I think there are other texts. Okay, that are not it's got Deuteron the Deuterocanonical apocrypha, and then yes. other apocrypha. Let's, yeah, that's right. Other ones as well. Yes. Yeah. Let me just take a quick look and see. Ah, oh, here we go. I mean, so, what we call probably the what we commonly got, call the apocrypha are only a certain number, but yeah. then you've got other ones in addition. Yeah. yeah. Esdras one, Esdras two, Esdras addition to Esther, Maccabees one and two. Tobias, Judith, Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, Epistle of Jeremiah, Susanna, Prayer of Zazariah, yeah. Prayer of Manasseh, the Bell and the Dragon, and Laodiceans. Now that's interesting. I've just learned something about the Apocrypha I didn't know before. So in other words, there was the Deuterocanonical Apocrypha, and then there's the other Apocrypha. Yeah. Well, the okay. Deuterocanonical ones are the ones that the Catholic and other versions put in into as the Bible, writing. yeah. But as, as, as you're saying, there are more in addition to those. So there's well. about 21 other books. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it, it's interesting. Some of the things you will find um, Bible text that uh, the Bible that we have, but that you can refer to some of those writings. So, um, and it may be that the people who wrote those were familiar. But I mean, um, we have the Bible as it stands, as we know it. Mm. Um.